Ooh, I'll stand back here. <laughs> Um, just a, a quick notice, the organ recitals, they start on the 14th of June, so not, not a couple of weeks yet, but it's John on the 14th of June, so that would be brilliant. Um, now, birthdays, I can see, see, my problem is, I wear my reading glasses so I can read up here, and then you all go into a blur at the back. <laughs> So if you're at the back of the room, as John Moff... <laughs> I know, but last week John Morris was waving at me to tell me it was his birthday and I missed him and I, I want to apologise, but I have to apologise when he's here. <laughs> okay, but, but I do know that it's Pat's birthday this week. <laughs> now... I'm looking carefully. Is there anybody else? See, I didn't have Mike last week, did I, to tell me, or there's somebody waving at you. Okay, we're going to sing happy birthday to you then, Pat. So happy birthday. God bless you. <laughs> Welcome, Mike, back. Hopefully refreshed from your time in Norfolk. Thank you. It's great to be back with you, and um, I'm not the only wanderer that's returned. There's a chap who's rather tanned that's just walked in. So that's Colin, yep. Um, Colin's just completed the Pennine Way, which was how many miles was it, Colin? 280. 280. Um, in three weeks, so well done. Um, It was so sunny, even his fingernails have caught the sun. That's how warm it was, um, which is quite unusual for the Pennines. But it's uh, fabulous to welcome you all. It's great to see you today on this wonderfully sunny day. And I think for the first day, it's warm because that wind has dropped. So be very careful when you're out there. We're going to leave the windows and the doors open to try and get some air coming through. So we come now to worship God, and I invite you to join me by responding to the words in the yellow bold. The work of the Creator is visible. Let us respond with praise. The example of Jesus is apparent. Let us respond with obedience. The wind of the Spirit is blowing. Let us respond with joy. And the Word of God is calling. Let us worship in spirit and in truth. So let's come together to worship God in our first hymn, which is Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. Sadly, we don't have the music group today because they're all unwell in various guises, so they are in our prayers. But David is going to do a wonderful job for us as we sing together. He's got a bit of experience.
Okay, please be seated. This is what happens when you have a phone call about half an hour before the service <laughs> that somebody's unwell. But well, thank you so much, David. Thank you all. The sentiments there open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. So as we sing holy, 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 let's just bow our heads in prayer and let's come together in prayer. For the joy of your presence, changing and renewing us day by day, we offer you our praise. For the blessing you bring us, the outpouring of your love day by day, we offer you our praise. For the peace beyond understanding, blessed assurance day by day, we offer you our praise. For the word that endures, teaches and challenges generation after generation, we offer you our praise. Creator God, you who love us more than we can know, who chose us from the very beginning to be family, we praise your holy name. Jesus Christ, Son of God, word became flesh, who dwelt among us and was sacrificed for us. We praise your holy name. Holy Spirit, present and powerful in our lives, from the moment we first believed, we praise your holy name. God of all ages, who from generation to generation has heard the cries of your children, humbly seeking forgiveness, and has welcomed sinners back into your embrace. Hear the thoughts of our hearts, examine our motives, and forgive our faults. So be with us today as we worship. Surround us with our prayers as we come to you, so that all who die and rise again may know you. So we seek your love this day, we seek your guidance, and we worship you. And so we pray together the words that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. So we're going to sing together again, this time a hymn that you will know very well, that will go back to your Sunday school days, that wonderful hymn, Tell Me the Stories of Jesus. Let's stand and sing.
Our first Bible reading this morning is from John chapter 20, verses 24 to 31. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. And our second reading is from Matthew 28, 16 to 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. May God add his blessing to this reading from his word. Thank you, Elizabeth. And apologies if you couldn't hear me in that first bit. I realised I'd left the microphone on mute. User error is always the, the issue most of the time. What you can't smell as well being there is the wonderful scent of the flowers coming through. And it just makes you realise how alive you are. And today I want us to try and bring a bit of life to four books of the Bible that we hear so often but might take a little for granted. Those are the Gospels. And in our Bible journey, we're moving from the Old Testament into the New Testament and into the Gospels. Of course, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And I just want to test your knowledge first with a bit of a quiz. It's not difficult. You've got a one in four chance <laughs> of getting it right. Just to make it easy, okay? One in four chance. I don't want... I need to find the questions now. So, what I don't want you to do is shout the answer out. I'll ask you to put your hand up, okay? So the first question is, which is the shortest gospel? If you think it's Matthew, put your hand up. Who thinks it's Mark? Oh, there seems some... Luke? John? It is, in fact... Mark. It is Mark. Okay, so which is the longest of the Gospels? Oh, Matthew, anybody? Oh, one or two. Mark? Luke? Oh, it's split evenly. John? Okay, and the answer is Luke. So Luke has 19,500 Greek words, and Matthew's the next with 18,500. So which Gospel has the most chapters? Oh... So we'll start at the beginning again. Matthew, anybody? One or two? Mark? Luke? John? Oh, most for John. The answer is actually Matthew, believe it or not. Okay? So which one is the odd one out in the way the writer tells the stories? Matthew? Mark? Luke? John? Yeah, it is John. So the first three are known as the Synoptic Gospels. So they kind of reflect each other. And John is a totally different style of writing. And the next question is, I've lost where I'm up to. Oh yeah, which Gospel do you think was written down first? Oh. Now here's a question. Which Gospel do you think was written down first? Who reckons Matthew? Who reckons Mark? 
Luke and John. It is, in fact, it's Mark. And I'm going to give you a clue here. Watch what Richard's doing. He's generally right. <laughs> okay. Um, so, and which gospel then contains the famous sayings, I am the way, the truth, and the life? Who reckons it's John? Yeah, it's, we'll just go with that. It's John's got the famous saying. Okay, and which writer was a doctor? Luke. You can see you all go, Luke, that's Luke, we know that one. Who also wrote the book of Acts? Luke as well. Yeah, absolutely. And which is the only gospel to tell the story of Jesus turning water into wine at the wedding in Cana? Now, this is getting your Bible knowledge going, ah, oh. So, who reckons it's Matthew? <laughs> I'm just looking who, which lay preachers are putting their hands up and going, ah. <laughs> Who reckons it's Mark? Luke? And John, it is in fact John, is the wedding at Cana. <laughs> it's written down, just reassurance to the lay preachers going, oh, it's written down, okay? And which is the only gospel to tell us about wise men visiting Jesus? Now this is another one to rack your brains in, because we hear it as a whole story, don't we? So who reckons it's Matthew? Who, rec <laughs> who reckons it's Mark? Luke? John? Oh, there's one or two. Okay, it is, in fact, Matthew. Um, so you've, you've done very well with the Bible quiz. Actually, it all gets muddled together, doesn't it, when we come to um, the Gospels? Because we just see them as one. We hear them together as one. And I want to tell you the story of a friend of mine, uh, a guy called Adam. Now, Adam was a big bloke. By big, I mean he was about six foot three, six foot four tall, and he was square with it. Okay, He was a warrant officer in the army when I met Adam. He was very intimidating. Quite an unpleasant guy, actually. I didn't warm to him at all. He was sceptical. He was angry at God. He disbelieved everything that was said. And I have to say, he actively worked against the chaplains. I remember doing a remembrance service, and Adam was there, and... He knew what was right, far better than I ever would. And it was a very interesting experience. Adam was hard work. He was badly damaged by his experience in the military. He'd served in places that you and I would never wish to be. And he'd seen things that you and I would never wish to see. He came across, sometimes as extremely young and immature, and other times as old beyond his days. But gradually, he changed. He had a revolution, a revolution, a revelation in his mind. He suddenly started being calm, chatting to the chaplains, asking questions that I wish people who'd been going to church for many years would ask, and then inquiring. And he said to me, Padre, he said, how do I know more about this God bloke you're talking about? How do I know it's true? What do I do? And I have to say, I, his scepticism was matched by mine. Because I thought, right, what's he up to? What's he want? What's going on? And I said, well, actually, I would suggest you probably be easier. Start with the Gospels. Start reading in through and just see how in it goes. So he started with Matthew and he read through, then Mark, then Luke, then John, and then he said, Padre, I couldn't stop, I just kept going. I really quite liked it. And he came to faith through the words he heard in the scriptures. But he didn't just stop there. As I said, he was quite a domineering character, but he put all that energy to resisting God into sharing God with others, and he converted other people to faith, including his assistant, because by this point he'd been promoted to an officer, and then other people he met. I was so grateful when he was asked to be baptised 
that he asked my colleague to do it because he wanted to be baptised on Good Friday in a lake in Senelaga, and it was cold. So I was grateful that he asked Justin to do it. <laughs> and I watched from the sidelines and then shared breakfast with them. It was wonderful. But this was the beginning of a journey that eventually led Adam to become a Christian. You know, of course, there's more to the story than that, more than just his encounter with the Bible. But in my line of work, I often meet people who are so sceptical about the Bible. And you've probably bumped into those sceptics too. In fact, we're frequently met with the attitude that the stories of Jesus in the Old Testament are probably just legend or myths, especially when it comes to the miracles. They can't be true. Well, the well-known atheist, Richard Dawkins, Oh, sorry, that's the one I was after, Jamie, thank you. The well-known atheist Richard Dawkins once wrote that, presumably, what happened to Jesus was what happens to all of us when we die. We decompose. Accounts of Jesus' resurrection, Dawkins said, and ascension are as, about as well-documented as Jack and the Beanstalk. Now, Richard Dawkins is a scientist by background, and I wouldn't want to challenge him on biology, but I'm willing to challenge him on this, because Richard Dawkins is not a scholar of ancient history. And in fact, what you'll soon find about the accounts of Jesus' life are that they're one of the best tested and recorded parts of history. Despite people assuming that there are all fables and fairy tales, there's a lot of evidence for the reliability of the New Testament, and especially the four Gospels. In fact, New Testament historian, not yet, I'll give you an odd. <laughs> In fact, New Testament historian N.T. Wright says of Jesus' crucifixion that it's one of the best attested facts in all ancient history. If you believe in ancient figures of the past like Julius Caesar, says N.T. Wright, Alexander the Great, you shouldn't, and Alexander the Great, you shouldn't have a problem believing that Jesus existed. I'm sure you recognise this chap. Probably guessing, I'm sure you can guess by the nose that he was Roman. So now there's a number of extra biblical sources that reference Jesus as well. And this is ancient historian and Roman senator Josephus, Josephus Tacticus. And he referenced Jesus. There was Pliny the Elder, don't change slides yet. Also a Roman author who referenced Jesus. But our main source of information about what happened is in this. It's in this historical document. Not what we call hymns and psalms, I've got the wrong one. <laughs> that we call the Bible. <laughs> hymns and psalms is old, but not that old. <laughs> it's called the Bible. So we... What are the stories we're dealing with? Well, all four Gospels fall into a genre of writing that the ancient world calls historical biography. So to people who say they were made up, they were legends, I'd say, no, they're written down and understood. That's historical accounts. Now, they may well be written in a different way to the way we write up stories today. And that's simple. That's because the way we write stories has changed over 2,000 years. But it doesn't make it any less reliable. It doesn't make it any less reliable at all. One of the objections often heard about the Gospels is that there are differences and contradictions between them. And it's true. There are differences. But none of them are... I knew I couldn't... I put this word in and I knew it wasn't going to work. None of them are... <laughs> None of them are difficult to reconcile. <laughs> and frankly, I should, shouldn't try and use big words, should I? And frankly, we should be suspicious of the accounts if they're all lined up perfectly. Indeed, when the police take an account of an event, if all the stories are the same, they're suspicious. Because it's very odd. If you've ever witnessed an incident or an accident... What you saw compared to the person that was sat next to you in the same vehicle will have been different. You'll recount it differently. And that's what makes 
the gospel's reliable. But it doesn't always mean they're telling the truth, does it? We've got to work that out in between. In the Bible as well, the gospels all came from different sources. They weren't written by the same person, so they're going to be slightly different. An interesting fact, many of the supposed contradictions actually tend to evaporate. Once you understand the literal, literal, ah, it's going to be one of those days. Literal, liter, ah, <laughs> literary genre. I knew there was big words. It just wasn't going to work. Once you understand the literary genre of the Bible, where the gospel, where people slightly had different attitudes today, the writers were more at liberty to put things in their own style, in their own way. When they watched things, they'd reorder them. So the story worked for the audience that was listening. And so that's what happened. Another objection we hear quite often is you can't trust the Gospels because they have their own agenda. They're just propaganda of this so-called Jesus movement. And the answer is quite simple to that one. Because everything we read has its own agenda, doesn't it? Every book we read has an agenda because they want to take us through the story. Every news article we read has an agenda because they want us to understand certain things. So, of course, the Gospels have an agenda because they want us to take us through the story of where it's going. So let's read again what it said in John 20. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in the book, but are written, these are written, so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. So of course there is an agenda. The Gospel writers believe Jesus is the Son of God, and they're writing down the things that happened to help people believe that. But having an agenda is completely normal, as I said, for every piece of writing. You'll not read anything without an agenda behind it that points you in a certain political direction, that takes you on a journey. But what we're getting here, and what we can trust we're getting here, is a true account of what happened. I think we can have trust that because there are three reasons. There's the manuscript evidence. David, don't look at it in detail. It's not the right manuscript. It was the only one I could find. But there is manuscript evidence, historical evidence, for the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And it's solid. And this is the key thing. The closer the texts are that were written down to the events, the more reason we have to trust that they're reliable. And the earlier copies we have, the more reason we have to assume they're trustworthy. On this, de- on this score, the New Testament outdates all of the records, historical records, by a country mile. And I remember when I was serving that people would say, you're not disturbed, Padre, because they've discovered this new testament of Thomas that tells the story that's slightly different to the Gospels. Do you know what my response was? No, because it reconfirms to me that it's true because it was seen by the direction of somebody else. When looking at other key historical figures of the ancient world, there's typically only a handful of documents that detail their life. In addition, those pieces of evidence were usually written down decades or even centuries following the events. Yet in contrast, the four Gospels are estimated to have been written down between 30 and 60 years after Jesus' life. And many letters by Paul that witness to the events are even closer to the life of Jesus. There are literally thousands of manuscripts from which, through the science of textual criticism, scholars are able to assemble with extraordinary accuracy what the original documents said. To this, you can also add the extra biblical accounts of Jesus' life and the early church, which contemporary writers such as Josephus and Tax and Tacitus have written down, and Pliny the Elder, they add to the story. So we know the manuscripts are there, and we know they're true. Then there's the details of the text themselves. Even more fascinating 
It's become well known that the details of the Gospels themselves confirm their accuracy and reliability. When it comes to their knowledge of geography, historical events and characters, and the details of local customs and culture. New Testament historian Richard Boekman's Jesus and the Eyewitnesses was a groundbreaking piece of scholarship. His research communicates how the Gospels themselves are filled with evidence that the authors were reporting eyewitness accounts of the events that the first followers of Christ had seen. One example is the names used in the New Testament. The frequency of names was cross-checked with Israeli scholar Tal Ilyan's research when a correlation found that the Gospels are full of the same names that were common during the times and places when Jesus lived. So it correlates. A small scriptural detail like this use of names supports that conclusion, theologians say, that the Gospels were recorded by people alive at the time, not invented at a later point. And the third reason we can trust is the archaeology. There's an excellent little book called Can We Trust the Gospels? Simple title, by Peter J. Williams. And in it, he details all manner of ways in which the Gospel writers show that they're clearly familiar with the times and places and customs of Jesus' day. Little things like when Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan, and he talks about the man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. You have to be local to know that Jerusalem's on a hill, and that the road that led to Jericho does indeed go down into Jerusalem, down from Jerusalem. Time and again, the Gospel writers tell of the events in the right place and the right historical context. They know where the towns are, where the lakes are, where the rivers are. They know the ways the different places are referred to and the different parts of Judea. If you compare the later accounts and details of Jesus' life, you immediately see the difference. Very little detail, very little custom, very little geography. And if you go to Israel today, you can see the sites that have been mentioned, that have been excavated, that keep proving that the New Testament is true. For instance, in John chapter 9, Jesus heals a blind man. Do you remember the story? Goes down to the pool and wash in the pool of Siloam in Jerusalem. But the location of the pool was unknown. It had never been discovered. That's until 2004, when during construction work, the steps of the pool were unearthed, and eventually the site was excavated, revealing a pool that makes sense to Jesus' story. That's just one of the many examples of archaeological finds that confirm the biblical accounts. So we've got good reason to trust that these accounts are reliable. And I could stand here all day giving you bits and pieces of information and evidence that we can trust them. But I'm not going to, thankfully. So we've got good reason to trust, to believe we can trust these accounts. But what difference does it make in the end? Well, when Adam discovered these accounts, when he heard that they speak of real people in a real historical context, it kind of blew his mind. He realized that it wasn't all make-believe. It wasn't a fictional story, but it was true. It propelled him to consider what next? It made him realize that it wasn't a rue, but it's real. And through that, he lived his life. Because the things that Jesus said and did actually happened. And they echoed through the stories we hear about him. And Adam, on his journey, started to wonder whether there really might be a God who had really revealed himself in Jesus and who could do things today through the Spirit. So do you know what he did to help reconcile that? He did something we all do regularly. He decided to pray. He prayed alone. He prayed with me. He prayed with other chaplains. And he ended up having an extraordinary series of conversations 
that led to specific answers in prayer that, as I said, eventually meant he put his trust in Christ. He became baptised. He took others on the journey with him. And he even started to train for lay ministry. That's the journey he went on. For me, what was even more remarkable was his PTSD that haunted him day by day, night by night, was controlled because he offered it to God. And he became a really, really nice bloke. One that I'm still in touch with and one who I would still count as a friend. He's still six foot odd tall. He's still square. He's still intimidating. But he's now a gentle rather than an aggressive giant that supports those around. But that was a conversion that was possible through the Gospels, through Scripture, and through faith. Because Adam came to believe what was written in these covers to be true. But this is what we have. We have these books, these texts. But don't just read them to know about Jesus but read them to know about the history of our faith. Read them to know that Jesus sends the Spirit today. That Jesus, through the Spirit, jumps from these pages into our hearts and converts people today. And we realise then that it's the same Jesus who converted people then. He's still in the business of transforming lives today. All we need to do is to learn to put our trust in him and in the words that are written. Amen. So let's just bow our heads for a moment in prayer. Lord, help us as we come to you. Help us to trust the words that are written in the Gospels. Help us have faith like Adam, reading, listening, praying and believing. And we pray for Adam now, Lord, wherever he is, whatever he's doing, the message that he's sharing this day. We pray for our faith, Lord, as we continue to make new discoveries about Scripture, as your Spirit continues to work in our lives and ask that you would be with us this day, providing that blessed assurance to us in our faith and in our journey. Amen. And we're going to stand and sing that wonderful hymn, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Let's stand and sing.
two. That's the one. That's the one. <laughs> right. Um, I should think all of us rem uh, remember when we were younger being carried. I know I used to pester my dad. Daddy, carry me. I'm, my legs are tired. So I'm going to use that as a theme this morning in our prayers. Um, on the overhead, you'll see a picture. It's actually a picture by Charlie Mackesy, who wrote and illustrated um, the boy, the mole, the fox, and the horse. And it's a picture of Rob Burrow and Kevin Sinfield. Rob Burrow and Kevin Sinfield played rugby league for Leeds Rhinos for 15 years until Rob became ill with motor neurone disease, MND, in 2019. His condition has deteriorated, and as this terrible disease has progressed, his friend, Kevin Sinfield, has raised more than seven million pounds for the MND community by fundraising events, including seven ultramarathons in seven days. At the recent Leeds Marathon, of which this is a picture, he pushed Rob the 26 miles in his chair and so that they could finish, the, finish together, he gently lifted him and carried him over the line. This is friendship. This is kindness. This is unselfish love. And it reminds me of what God does for us each and every day. Let us pray. Loving Lord, we thank you for your love and your friendship, which carries us through dark and difficult days. We pray for Rob Burrow and his family and people like him who are coping with difficult health issues, cancer, MND, MS, ME, depression, back pain, dementia. We will all know someone, maybe ourselves, someone in our family, a friend. So in a moment of quiet, we bring those people on our hearts to you. We pray for healing. We pray that you will carry those who are unwell. We pray this morning for those living in fear, where bombs are dropping, fighting raging, homes destroyed. We can only imagine how terrifying that would be. What would we do if we lost everything? We pray for refugees worldwide, that you will be with them and carry them to safety. We pray for those whose lives have been disadvantaged, people born into poverty, those suffering exploitation, those who turn to crime, alcohol and drugs, their lives so difficult. We think of those exploited by others and pray for the 13,000 people held in slavery in the UK today. It is shocking, Lord, and we pray that your loving arms will carry those people. Lord, we pray for those involved in the terrible train crash in India yesterday. So many lives lost and hundreds of people injured. Please be with them, Lord, and their families and bring comfort as you carry them through this nightmare. Lord, we pray for our local communities in Camberley and surrounding area thanking you for all those who help and support others. The NHS, nursing homes, emergency services, army, council, local charities and our schools. We pray for our children and young people, especially those doing exams. Please bless them and carry them through this exam season. Thank you, Lord, for High Cross and all those here today. Please bless those who come with worries or in need of support. 
We pray for all those who visit High Cross during the week and pray that they will find your spirit of love and welcome in this place. So, loving Lord, please carry us and our church each day. As Kevin and Rob's friendship is a shining example, may your friendship and love for each of us shine out to all we meet. We ask all this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Pam. What a powerful image. And I want you to hold that in mind as we come to our communion, as we come to sing together, There is a Redeemer. And I invite those who are serving to come up and join me at the front. There is a Redeemer. So we do come to our communion. Come to this table not because you must, but because you may. Not because you're strong, but because you are weak. Come not because any goodness of your own gives you a right to come, but because you need mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord a little and would like to love him more. Come because he loved you and gave himself for you. Come and meet the risen Christ, for we are his body. So I remind you, those that may be here for the first time, that this table is open to all. The bread is gluten-free, the wine is alcohol-free, so anybody who are able and willing is welcome to join us. And you may realise that I'm joined by a bit of a muttly crew today. <laughs> and it is wonderful to have some different faces at the front. It's very unusual to be surrounded by all male servers. It's, it's normally me that's the odd one out. So I am delighted to welcome you all and thank you so much for helping me serve today. So let's just bow our heads as we come to share in this feast. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open and all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. So the Apostle Paul tells us of the institution of the Lord's Supper 
He says, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he gave him thanks, he broke it and said, Eat this, all of you, for this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in the same way, he then took the cup, cup of wine and said, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So let's bow our heads in prayer. Loving God, we praise and thank you for your love shown to us in Jesus Christ. We thank you for his life and ministry, announcing the good news of your kingdom and demonstrating its power in the lifting of the downtrodden and the healing of the sick and the loving of the loveless. We thank you for his sacrificial death upon the cross, for the redemption of the world and for your raising him to life again as a foretaste of the glory we shall share. We give you thanks for this bread and wine, symbols of our world and signs of our transforming love. Send your Holy Spirit, we pray, that they may be renewed into the likeness of Jesus Christ as we are formed into his body. Bless us as we receive these elements, we pray. Surround us with your love and strengthen us in our faith. This we pray in his name and for his sake. Amen. So we remember that Jesus took bread, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So our servers will come and serve you bread and then wine and encourage you to eat and drink as you receive. Just be still and to remember God.
Let's bow our heads in prayer. Let's pray. Loving God, you have fed us generously at this table. As we've remembered Jesus and rejoiced that he's with us today, we're ready now to follow him and to be your people in the world. May your Holy Spirit show us the way, make us holy, and fill us with love. Amen. Amen. And so we stand to sing our final hymn, Thy hand, O God, has guided thy flock from age to age. Let's stand and sing. So we're just going to pause as we come to the end of our service, accept God's blessing and reflect on all we've done today. So let us pray. Lord, we ask your blessing upon us this day. We thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you for your word that is open to each one of us. And we thank you that you have called us to follow. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be with each one of us this day and forever. Amen. Amen. Now our worship has ended. May our service begin. <laughs>